Thank you uh, again. Shall I leave this? That's fine. Shall I leave this up or can everybody has read this? Don't don't leave after nine. That's the main message. <clears throat> okay. All oh, right. Okay. So um, yesterday I introduced you to uh, the background equations in cosmology, describing the densities and uh, how the densities relate to the geometry of the universe. And the key point that we uh, that we or the, the the goal in this lecture series is to to, to relate the initial conditions to what we can observe uh, on the sky. In particular, we want to look at these correlation functions, and I explained that in order to do that, um, assuming that these uh, statistical properties are conserved, uh, we need to derive the function that propagates, propagates the initial conditions to, uh, to, for example, the CMB. So that will be our main focus of today, uh, deriving these linear transfer functions. Um, Okay, so as a reminder, the two key equations that we derived yesterday were the two Friedman equations. So the first Friedman equation tells us how geometry is related to the densities. And then the second Friedman equation tells us something about the acceleration, how the acceleration is related to the densities. And primes, as a reminder, in, in this lecture is this, uh, our time, cosmological time derivatives as opposed to dots. So this is the second Friedman equation. Okay, so these were the two key equations. Uh, now, to get, uh, to learn something about the evolution of fluctuations, we need to perturb the Einstein equations that we introduced yesterday. Uh, and in principle, we also need to introduce interactions. Uh, so obviously, things like particles interact with fluctuations in the metric, uh, and then these particles can scatter off of other particles. Uh, and the main mechanism of scattering in the early universe is via Thomson scattering of CMB photons uh, of, of free electrons. Um, but deriving Deriving all these uh, scattering relations actually requires uh, quite some work. So I'll first explain you how to include perturbations in, in the metric, and then I'll just give you the solution of uh, the induced scatterings. Okay, so let's uh, look at this. Um, yeah. Shall I do a new board? Yep. Okay, so the Einstein equation to perturb them, so quite generally, we have uh, um, the metric, which could now be a function of both time and uh, spatial, spatial components. We simply write this as some background metric, which is just a function of time plus fluctuations in that metric, which you defi define as h mu nu, which can be a function of both time and space. Similarly, we can uh, write down fluctuations in the energy-momentum tensor, which we can split into a time component part only. And of course, we have to bar this. Let's also bar this one. Plus delta t, mu, mu, t, and x. Now, of course, the way we have to perturb this um, in principle, you can add scalar vector and tensor perturbations. And as I mentioned already yesterday, if we would have to do that and have to worry about all these different components leaking and interacting with other components, uh, that would make our life quite bad. Uh, but luckily, there's such a thing as, uh, which is called the scalar vector uh, tensor decomposition theorem, or SVD for short, which tells you that these are all um, these are all disconnected at linear order. So that means if I want to know how scalars evolve, scalar degrees of freedom evolve, then I can just perturb only uh, uh, the metric with scalar degrees of freedom. And I do not have to include vector and tensor degrees of freedom. 
And the same is true if I want to know how tensors evolve, uh, I only have to follow the tensor degrees of freedom or the tensor perturbations. And that's useful, for example, because we will also consider gravitational waves, which are tensor-like degrees of freedom. Now, in the notes, I, I, de I derived this to some degree. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to take a look at that. And there's plenty of literature explaining how does is SVD comp decomposition works. But for now, I'm just telling you that's the way it is. Also, as a reminder, um, these, the average metric here, so we're working with uh, cosmological time again, is just A squared times the matrix with 1 uh, and 3 minus 1s on the diagonal for the spatial components. Um, OK, so let's perturb. Uh, the metric. And the way we perturb the metric, again, I mean, it's a little bit, the choices that we'll make are a little bit arbitrary. And if you look at literature, the names of the, co the, the components with which you, which you perturb the metric, they differ. Uh, so please don't, you know, don't, they're not somehow fundamental in one way or another. We make a particular choice. Um, and the choice we, fo we follow, in this case, uh, Dodelson, so that's a book that you can look up. Um, uses the following components, so for h mu nu, the time time component is perturbed as 1 minus 2a, the 0i and 0j, uh, i 0 component are perturbed as minus a times b with a derivative, spatial derivative, and the tensor, the spatial part of the metric is perturbed as a squared times 2 delta ij psi minus 2 e and two derivatives, spatial derivatives. Um, for example, here we use psi, but then uh, Bauman uses c, for example, for that particular parameter. So it, just to say, that you shouldn't take too much note in all these uh, all these different names. The main point is we have uh, four scalar scalars here. So we have a, b, psi, and e. So these are our our, our th four scalar degrees of freedom in which we perturb the metric. Now the next step um, that we need to do. Is we know that the um, uh, we know that the space-time interval in GR should be invariant on a general uh, corner transformation, and we'll use that to see how we have to change these uh, these perturbations in order to keep the space-time interval invariant. So in GR we have G alpha beta, um, D mu alpha. G mu, sorry, dx, dx beta equals g mu nu, dx, dx nu. So that tells us that, um, so of course you have new twiddles, that g alpha beta twiddle dx alpha twiddle dx beta twiddle dx mu, dx mu equals g mu nu. OK, and now if we want to apply a general coordinate transformation, but of course that, that coordinate transformation still needs to preserve the isotropy and homogeneity of the universe. Uh, so in this case, we just say that x mu goes to x mu twiddle, which is given by x mu uh, Sorry. Plus epsilon u, which of course can depend on time and position. And this epsilon is given by um, epsilon zero, so the time component of this transformation plus delta ij epsilon i j. Okay, so um, 
we have now, so there's two, again, there's two, um, sorry, not ij, comma j, because this has to be a scalar. <coughs> so these are two scalar degrees of freedom that you introduce in, in terms of um, the transformation. It preserves uh, uh, the isotropy and homogeneity. And uh, the next step is to implement this transformation and see how these components, these scalar components in the perturbed metric um, uh, have to change in order to keep the space-time interval invariant. Yeah, that's the task at hand. Okay, so yeah, and we, S here stands for scalars or scalar. And you can write down a general coordinate transformation also with vector and tensor components, right? So, but here we focus solidly on the scalar components. So that's why we use label S. Okay. All right, so you can do that and work your way through, uh, well, basically just work your way through this equation and make sure that the left and right hand side equate with the proper transformation of these scalars. So as an example, uh, let's consider A. Okay, so let's consider A in this, in this case. Um, we could set, in the equation above, we can set a mu um, equals mu equals zero. Um, and then we have to sum over all indices alpha and beta, okay? But things nicely simplify in this case. So for example, take alpha equals zero and beta equals j. Um, then we'll find that the perturbed met metric uh, zero j by definition is minus b twiddle comma j. And then we know that because delta x twiddle i d tau sorry, dt, is, um, is of order epsilon, s. This product of the two, so g o j with uh, dxi dt, dx twiddle dt, is second order, and so we, have, we can ignore it, right? Because we're looking at only linear, uh, we're only looking at the linear uh, corrections. Um, and a similar argument can be made when alpha, so similar argument, Right, so that means that these terms are second order. So in some sense, whenever there's a whenever g is of first order, then this of course th that means that the dx uh, dt's or dx um, uh, yeah can cannot be of first order, and therefore all of those terms can be ignored. So second order. be ignored. And a similar argument can be made when, so same, similar argument when alpha equals i and beta equals j. Okay. Now, in the end, the terms that remain will lead to the following equation. So we get minus 1 plus 2a twiddle. Right, so a twiddle is, the, is the basically is the, is the uh, transformed a dt twiddle dt equals minus 1 plus 2a 1 plus Delta epsilon zero. Uh, sorry, uh, derivative respect to time squared, which is uh, equivalent to one minus two a twiddle 
minus 2 epsilon 0 dt. All right, so we ignored again all terms that are quadratic in the perturbations, both in the, in the, uh, the, the corner transformation as well as in the perturbation of the metric itself. So doing this then leads us to the following relation. So we get that in order to preserve um, the space-time interval, then A twiddle has to be equivalent to A minus uh, 1 over A epsilon dot 0. So in this case, dot is a uh, uh, conformal time derivative. Okay, So that's, the, that's how you would do these kind of things. Now, um, without going through them, you can derive similar relations for, um, for the other scalars. For completeness, I'll write them down. Uh, and these are given by, oops, they're just here. Uh, So that uh, is psi twiddle, which is equivalent to psi plus h epsilon zero. We have b twiddle, which, oh, do I? Oh yeah, there's a minus, very good, thanks. Uh, is b plus epsilon dot minus epsilon zero over A, and the final one is E twiddle, which is E plus epsilon S. So they is complete all the transformations, and the main point now is that we have four, uh, four scalars coming from the perturbed metric. We have two scalars coming from the coordinate transformation, and if we cleverly choose, um, those coordinate transformations, we can end up with only two degrees of freedom. Yes, so that's, uh, right, so we have four scalars in perturbed <coughs> metric, and we have uh, two scalars from coordinate transformation. If we, if we choose those cleverly, we can go to just a total of two degrees of freedom that we care about. In some sense, you're setting the other degrees of freedom to zero if you cleverly choose them. Um, and if you do that, you fix what is, so if you do this, you fix the gauge. That's how you refer to this, right? So you're fixing gates, gauge fixing. Oh. Okay. So let's see um, what that's all about. Um, and in principle, and that was uh, pointed out by Bardeen, you can choose uh, your perturbations, your scalar perturbations in a clever way such that they do not transform. Um, so they're gauge independent. So independent of the gauge choice that I make, these quantities always remain the same. And the two that Bardeen pointed out are given by the following. So Bardeen showed that there's these two quantities, which he denoted as psi A. It's a linear relation of A plus one over A, D, D tau, A, E dot plus B, and phi B equals minus psi, plus A H B minus E 
dot. So why do you why do you want these kind of quantities? What's the use of these gauge invariant quantities? So it turns out, and we'll actually have a quite like basically quite a few examples of this, where if you compute something in a particular well, find a problem, you think if I set some of the degrees of freedom to zero, then that problem simplifies. Yes, a particular physical problem that you want to solve. But now you want to relate that to uh, another problem that might be solvable using a different gauge. And then you use these gauge invariant quantities to go from one gauge to the other. So it's just one way. Uh, and that's, so, it's, so, so in some sense, these, having these gauge invariant quantities allows you to uh, go from one choice to another choice, where the choice typically that you make is uh, based on whether a, a problem simplifies. So, as an example, we mostly work uh, for what we'll do next in the Newtonian gauge, but when we work on inflation, uh, it's more useful to use the co-moving gauge. Yeah? And so in order to relate things between those two gauges, you can use these gauge invariant quantities. Okay, so. Um, what did I want to say next? Oh yeah. Now, of course, anything that's observable is always gauge invariant, okay? So that's something important. It shouldn't depend on the choice of gauge, what you measure. Uh, so that's something, so an observable. Always gauge invariant. Okay. All right. So let's let's run through some choices um, that are you, that are, can be made in cosmology. Uh, the first one is the Newtonian gauge, which we'll use uh, throughout uh, the rest of this lecture. So what is this gauge choice? Okay, so in this case, the metric only has two uh, degrees of freedom. Um, oh, actually, maybe I wanted to do something other first. Sorry, yeah, I, I'm skipping a step. Um, I forgot that we have to go first perturb the energy momentum tensor. So let's me do that first. So energy momentum tensor. So the choice and way we perturb this, again, we follow very similar notation as we just used for the metric. This is proportional to variations in the density. The zero J components are proportional to the velocity. P plus rho V comma I. And then Variation in the spatial part are given by a squared delta ij delta rho plus the stress energy tensor. Okay, so we've again defined four scalars fluctuation in the densities, velocity, and then, um, sorry, this should be p in the pressure and the stress energy tensor. Um, you can show that the four velocity, um, the perturbed four velocity is given by a minus one minus a comma v plus b i. So please see uh, my notes for their vision of this. And then in this case, the velocity can be written in terms of a scalar component and a vector component. And since we're only interested in uh, the scalar part, this is basically, these are related, yeah? 
Um, and also bi is zero, right? We only be interested in scalars. Um, the stress energy tensor um, depends on the kind of problem at hand, what kind of fluids you're dealing with. For a perfect fluid, this term is zero. Okay, so for perfect fluid, Okay. Um, so in some sense, I mean, now we're, we can choose gauges in such a way that either we are able to set some of these degrees of freedom zero, or we can set degrees of freedom in the metric to zero. Uh, so that's how you choose your gauge. Okay, what are these gauges? So as I mentioned before, the, the gauge that we'll use today is the Newtonian gauge. So that really sets two degrees of freedom in the metric to zero. Okay. And some, well, it's sometimes called the conformal Newtonian gauge because we use tau here. And in that case, ds squared is given by a squared minus one plus psi, two psi, d tau squared plus one minus two psi, phi, I guess phi, uh, delta ij, delta x, i, delta x, j. So if we look at uh, our original perturbations in the metric, we have associated a with psi and um, um, uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of annoying. So this is this is lowercase psi, <laughs> which is uh, minus phi. Okay, in here. Okay. Now, this is not the only choice you can make, and there's some other popular choices. Uh, there's the so-called synchronous gauge. And in that gauge, we set uh, A equals B equals zero. And what you'll see is that now there's no more, uh, there's no more, um, uh, there's no more perturbation in the, in the time component, right? So that's why it means from, for every single observer, clock runs the same, yeah? Okay. Spatially flat gauge is another choice. And as you might imagine, <laughs> that would mean that the spatial part is basically unperturbed. So you set psi uh, and, um, and E to zero, yeah? So then there's no more perturbation in, in, in the spatial part, the metric. And another choice is the co-moving gauge. And in that case, you set V and B to zero. So in this case, uh, you, uh, you use your freedom to set uh, V to zero in the energy momentum tensor. And we will, this is a gauge that's very popular uh, for doing calculations during inflation. And we'll explain why uh, tomorrow, well, Thursday. Okay, now Bardeen has these very nice gauge invariant quantities, but there are, other, there are other possibilities. And another very important one, or two important ones, are the so-called so curvature perturbations. And those are also used, again, when we do inflationary calculations and relate perturbations during inflation to perturbations in the uh, observed fields. And we'll use that today, for example. 
and uh, tomorrow. So what are these two gauge invariant quantities? Uh, zeta, which is minus very, so again, it's similar to the other, well, I guess I already deleted it uh, or erased it, plus one third lambda squared E plus curly H delta rho over rho dot. That's one. And then there is R, which is the one we will use. Again, minus psi plus, sorry, minus, oh, there's a minus here. Minus one third lambda squared E. And now the final term is again curly H times V plus B. So here you already see if I take the co-moving gauge, then things simplify, right? Because we've set this to zero. And that will that will help us quite a bit later on. And we'll explain why. The reason why these so these are called curvature. Uh, the reason why these are called curvature perturbations, if, if I compute the three curvature of the, the metric, of the perturbed metric, then that will be equivalent to, will be proportional to this term here. So this is proportional to R3. Um, it's also true that if I look on scales that are uh, super horizon, so in that case, any mode is much, much, well, either larger than eight, one over h, or depending on whether you get physical scale or momentum, um, then these two are the same. Yeah, so then they, you can't separate them. And in fact, th then they're also constant, something that you can show. So on supervising scales, these perturbations are constant. Okay, any questions about this so far? So again, like we'll use this one mostly for inflation. We're doing doing calculations. Use this perturbative degree of freedom, and we choose a particular gauge where this term here is zero. A co-moving gauge. Okay. Now, um, once that we've written out our perturbations uh, and we've chosen a particular gauge, so in, in, this, in this case we, we choose the Newtonian, the conformal Newtonian gauge. Yeah, so after you choose the gauge, after choosing a gauge, We can then compute everything we did before, but then in the perturbed case, right? So we can start to compute our perturbed Christoffel symbols, our perturbed Ricci scalar, Ricci tensor, and work all this out. Um, I will not bother with that, writing that down, because it's quite, in fact, Will just did some of this, but not in the perturbed universe. And I think Bauman said something like, nobody in his right mind would ever do this, but, uh, you will do it. You will do it during an exercise session. So, uh, but not for the perturbed case, which is a little bit more tricky, even more tricky. But yeah, th the idea is once you have chosen this gauge, you compute your Christoffel symbols, and then you can compute uh, um, your uh, relevant, the, all the relevant equations. So, what is the relevant equation for our purpose here? Because we want to learn about the propagation of photons in. And so, if we go back to yesterday's lecture, right, we derived the propagation of photons and how they lose energy as they propagate to the universe. So we want to use the geo geodesic equation again, but then including all the possible per uh, perturbations. Yeah. So we follow again the geodesic, so let me write that here. So let's do that.
and we write it, we rewrite it in the following way. So we have dp mu d lambda equals d uh, tau d lambda d p mu d tau. Recall, uh, and this is actually the same as p naught d uh, p mu d tau. Uh, and recall that p mu is defined such that d x mu uh, as d x mu d lambda. And of course, d tau, then d t, d lambda, sorry, is p naught, okay? p zero. Okay. Um, now we can use all the perturbed Christoffel symbols. Um, to find, and again, I'm not going to derive that here, but uh, to de derive the following relation, dp naught d tau equals minus curly h plus psi dot p naught minus 2 delta psi phi minus curly h minus phi dot minus 2 h psi plus phi plus delta i j p i oh sorry times p j p naught Okay, then you say, well, that's not, that's not very insightful. <laughs> uh, and of course, the main point is that things will drastically simplify, uh, luckily for us. Um, there's one small caveat before we start simplifying this equation. And, uh, and that is that what we've been doing now is we've been using the uh, four momentum as observed, well, for a, par for a photon that's co-moving with... Uh, uh, with a frame that um, um, that's that's in curved space time, yeah. But what we observe, of course, is not that we're we're observing a photon in our own inertial frame, um, and that frame is asymptotically flat. Now, for our unperturbed equations, these are just conformally related by a factor of a. But for a perturbed universe, that's not the case. So we have to be very careful. So that's a caveat. And so in order to deal with that, so the fact that we're no longer, we can no longer rely on the fact that our, our local inertial frame is conformally related to the, the co-moving frame, uh, we do use the fact that uh, space-time, sorry, the, 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 um, the modulus of the four momentum, that that's frame independent. So if we use that, we can make uh, relations that we'll then use to plug into this equation, and that will allow us to derive um, the perturbed version of um, energy conservation for a photon. Okay, so what do we do? So we have a we have we now have to take our own inertial frame, um, which is asymptotically fat, which we which we define as having a metric eta mu nu, and I put these daggers on for the fact that this is our uh, that is a different frame, and then the frame, of course, that we have to relate it to is g mu nu is just is the one that's co-moving. So how do we do that? As said, the, the, the modulus of the four momentum of the 
of the photon is conserved, it's frame independent. So we write that um, eta, uh, yes, we put it here, mu, mu is the same as p mu p nu. Okay? So that's what we use, and of course then we have to define what are these uh, four momenta, and these are the same as before. So we had p nu hat defined as e comma p i, so that's the spatial components of the four momentum, which is given by e p hat uh, i. And now this is, of course, the direction, and this is the fact that we use different, we are on this inertial frame, right? So these uh, apologies for the notation here. Okay. Um, now we can relate it to, and that allows us to write the following. We just write out this equation. So we get minus e squared plus delta ij p i hat p j hat equals g zero zero p zero squared plus g i j p i p j. Okay? And then the main point is of course that we relate this part to that and we relate this to that which gives us the following relations that E is given by squared of minus G zero zero times P zero and lowercase P squared. Okay, so this is lowercase, this is our uh, three momentum squared equals G I J P I P J equals delta i j p i hat p j hat capital P's. All right, so you see already we have now terms. So these terms, of course, they depend on our perturbed metric, right? So what you'll see is that these e and these uh, these p's here are related, uh, and they they pick up uh, perturbative quantities. Okay, so we can do that. So let's work this out. So we get that P naught equals E over squared of G zero zero, which is E over square root of A squared one plus two psi. That's our conformal Newtonian gauge. And this is equivalent to E over A, one minus psi, okay? To, to lowest order. Then we have PI equals E over squared of G I I P I in the direction. So this is only the, the directional vector of P equals E over A squared one minus two pi square root. And that is, sorry, P i hat equals e over a one plus pi p i hat. Okay, so we have the we have the now the the, the properly um, defined quantities in our own inertial frame. So that's what we observe on Earth. And again, without doing the math, but what you, if you then use these equations 
and insert them into this long equation here, you get an even longer equation, but to linear order, and many things drop, and you can rewrite a few terms, and then you'll end up with the following equation. So using this in the perturbed geodesic, we arrive at the following, one over E, the uh, ED tau equals curly H plus phi dot minus P I hat delta I psi. Okay. So that looks a little bit familiar because the first term here we already had before. Yeah, so this term here we had already in the unperturbed universe. And of course that makes sense because there's no perturbative quantities here. So this is already you had in the perturbed universe, which led us to the derivation that the energy drops as one over A. Yeah. So we saw this before. Um, the other two terms. Um, so the other two terms can be interpreted as follows, okay? So let's call this number two, and this is number three. Um, so if we think about, so again, like, remember that this psi, sorry, this phi appears in the spatial part of the metric. So you can think about that as being perturbations in the scale factor. Yeah, so if we, if we think about this term as, so we say, like, a twiddle uh, t comma x is um, sorry this should be tau is effectively a tau one minus phi. Then this term is simply stating that there are perturbations in the scale factor which change uh, which change its equation. Um, and number three is the result of uh, photons moving into the, gra the gravitational potential, which uh, leads to a blue shift. And the opposite, moving out. leads to a redshift. So these are the contributions to our perturbed energy conservation equation. Yeah. So we have the usual one over A. Then there's the fact that A itself is perturbed. And so that leads to phi dot. And then there's the fact that the photon can move in or out of a gravitational potential. And that leads to the third term. OK. Now, you can rewrite this expression a little bit more. Um, so this expression can be rewritten in the following way. D ln A E D tau is D psi D tau plus phi prime That's correct. I'm not sure if this is correct. That doesn't that doesn't look right.
it's in my notes, but I'm a little doubtful that this is correct. So, <laughs> pardon my. Uh, I'll check later if somehow I made a mistake there. But um, okay, so I'm not sure if this is correct. So I made, might have made a mistake. The reason why I'm a little confused here is because I put primes here while I use tau here. So that's why I'm confused. Okay, um, now given that uh, you can do a, a rewrite, it turns out that you, you can solve this equation by, uh, by doing an integral. But before we integrate this equation, we have to relate the, um, the energy to temperature, right? Because energy is something that we do not measure directly. What we measure is the temperature. And we can then perturb the, uh, the temperature because we want to look at perturbations in the temperature. So let us write it in the following way. So if you say that A times E is proportional to A times T, uh, where there's an average, which is a function of tau, and then there's a perturbation. And now we get to this theta, which I mentioned earlier on, which can be a function of tau and position. This is how we write the perturbation. And then we collect all terms and realize that if I take the log of AE, that effectively is of order uh, theta plus theta squared. So we neglect this, so literally it's just theta. So that's why this is such a useful way of rewriting it, okay? Okay. Um, all right, so now that we have an expression, we can do the integral of this and then solve. And that basically should give us our, our final result. But of course, there is a caveat because we're basically missing uh, a bunch of terms. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, in order to do this integral, uh, we have first have to define uh, conformal time as before. So we know, that's, we know that a d tau equals dt. So we can rewrite that as an integral for the, uh, the tau, the conformal time component, which is dt over a, which is the integral of dA over a squared h. We also have to, we can also define co-moving Distance psi, which is just c times tau. But then throughout, we mostly set c equals to 1, so they are equivalent, right? So um, if c equals 1, then tau equals psi. Um, then, what we do, of course, we make when we do this integral, we have to think about where are we making observations. So observations are made at today, so that's tau naught uh, and x naught. Well. Of course, C and B photons were emitted at last scattering. So they're coming from tau star x star. Um, yes. And then we define this xi, we define xi star to be um, x star times n. That's direction n. Uh, sorry. Obviously, that's not correct. X star vector is xi star times n. And this equates to tau 0 minus tau star n. OK? So having all these quantities uh, in terms of formal time and conformal distance, we can write the solution to this integral. And we find that theta today in direction n hat is given by theta 
star, so uh, the perturbation at last scattering, minus psi naught minus psi star, plus an integral running from tau star till today of d tau, the derivatives of psi plus phi. Okay. So that would be our result. Now, uh, we you typically ignore uh, psi naught because that's the, uh, the value of uh, the local gravitational potential, and that cannot be uh, distinguished from or cannot be observed effectively. So you usually ignore it. Well, you have to ignore it because you can't observe it. Not. OK. So then this would be our solution for the fluctuations in the temperature direction n as observed from Earth on the sky. Now the main thing, of course, is that we completely neglected any interactions. Yeah, so this would be true if there would be no interaction. That would be the, uh, the end of the story, and we could pack our bags and uh, move, on to, or move on to inflation, effectively. But now we, uh, we have to include interactions. So that's what we'll do next. Right, so. Uh, we did not include interactions. OK. So let's do that now. <clears throat> so we have to take a step back. We shouldn't have integrated this function, but just to show that you know, this is the result if, in principle if there were no interactions. Uh, and also one other thing here is that we have assumed somehow that all of these photons were emitted uh, instantly and there's no, so normally the seam ha CMB has some thickness, right? It's not exactly instant, uh, but in order to do this integral, you have to assume that it's instant. Okay, so how do we proceed? Um, I'm just going to give you the, the scattering components so we can write down d, d, uh, theta d tau. Uh, scattering, which is given by uh, minus a n e uh, sigma t theta minus, or sorry, plus three a n e sigma t over sixteen pi integral d m at one uh, plus n at m at squared theta, and then there's a final term minus a n e sigma t v v. Okay. All right. So now we have to introduce a couple of uh, things. So this is the Thomson cross section. Uh, Ne is the uh, electron number density. And um, uh, VB is defined as dx uh, d tau. Okay, and so what are these different terms? The first term is um, this, uh, the first term is the scattering out of the beam. The second term is uh, into the beam. And the third term here is defined as the, the Doppler term. Oh, 
Okay, so these are the different contributions to the scattering part. So now that we uh, have all the ingredients, we should equate the scattering part with the gravitational part that we derived earlier. Yeah, so they equate one another. And if you do that, uh, and I leave that as an exercise, you can massage all the terms. So remember, we already had uh, d theta, d tau for the gravitational part um, coming from the, from the geodesic equation. And now we, we want to equate that to the, the scattering part. Um, and if you do that, you get the following solution, that d e to the minus tau this is kind of annoying because we also use tau for the optical depth, so I'll use tau twiddle in this case, but it will not reappear, tau twiddle, so just for this equation. Um, theta plus psi, d tau equals minus tau twiddle dot e to the minus tau twiddle psi minus n hat dot phi b plus 3 over 16 integral dm hat 1 plus n dot m hat squared theta plus e to the minus tau twiddle dot plus psi dot. So that's our final expression. We've defined this optical depth. Which is tau twiddle is the integral of a n e sigma t d tau and this term here is the so-called visibility function which tells you uh, the probability of last scattering of a photon at a given time tau okay Okay, so this looks like a very complicated expression, and in some sense it is. Um, and so in principle, what you should do if you want to solve this equation, you'd have to integrate again. Um, but you, it's, it's not easy to do this analytically, right? So uh, what we therefore use, and that will be the topic of Thursday's uh, tutorial, is that you can rewrite this in the following way. I can write this as theta plus psi um, not, sorry, not outside. So that's today equals integral from some initial time, which we can set to zero for most practical purposes, to today, of uh, a, this source function s d tau. And this source function s is basically everything on this side. Yeah? So that's what you're doing. Um, and this is exactly what all the Boltzmann solvers are doing. So if you install CAMP or CLASS, this is exactly what it does, right? So it has the full expression here. It integrates this uh, function and then gets, gives you the perturbed uh, uh, temperature and then computes correlation functions, right? So this is what's done in any Boltzmann solver, so CAM or class, right? They're doing 
like this. Now we cannot do that analytically, but we still can get some intuition. We should get a larger pH of. Okay, so again, we can make some um, simplifications. So note that, okay, can we, some, some analytical insights. So in order to do that, we can uh, first realize, okay, 1 plus n hat dot m hat squared is just uh, 1 plus cosine phi squared, where phi is the, um, the angle, the scattering angle. And because you're integrating over that, you can take the you can assume that it's, it's the you can take the average, right? So that's what we make as an approximation. So the first approximation, we take the average of this, which means we somehow we take out theta out of the integral and then just integrate over this function, and that is equivalent to four thirds. Then um, we have we can define the, uh, well, monopole moment in the following way. So it would be dm theta over 4 pi, and we define this as theta bar. And then the third thing is instant, again, last scattering, which means that uh, our visibility function becomes a delta function, okay? Now, if you make all these assumptions, you get the following result for this integral for this complex. Oh yeah, right, right bigger? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, so if we do this, we get for the final expression, theta plus psi as measured today is given by this, uh, monopole moment uh, at last scattering plus psi at last scattering minus n uh, hat dot vb plus this term tau star tau not d tau psi dot plus phi dot. Okay, so this is our final expression. Um, where we ignored, again, the, the potential at uh, our local potential, right? So psi zero we can ignore because it's unobservable. Um, now this monopole here really measures the, the, the radiation energy density. Yeah, so if we relate this to the radiation energy density, we can actually state that this is uh, similar to uh, delta gamma, so that's radiation over four because of the scaling. And if we do that, we can further rewrite this in the following way, which is kind of, yeah, let's do that here. So then it's just theta zero, in direction n hat is given by one fourth the radiation energy density plus psi at last scattering, which we call term number one, minus n hat dot v b, which we call term number two, and then this is at last scattering plus this final integral. We call
call term number three. Okay, so these are the important contributions to fluctuations in the temperature field. So just as a reminder, right, because that's what we said early on, this is really uh, delta T over T, typically, okay? Which is what we want to use. Because uh, it's our local potential, and so that means all around, we, there's no way to distinguish this from the overall normalization of what you observe. Yeah? Yeah, it's because it's, yeah, because we're right in the middle of it, so. Um, yeah? Say it again. Yes. Uh, uh, why are we not doing the integral? Uh, well, um, that's a good question. So, by the way, I forgot the boundaries here. Um, no, I think, yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Well, the point is that this phi, hmm, I actually don't know the answer to that, why we don't do the integral, but. Um, these are partial, yeah, these are partial, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe that's the reason, yeah. Maybe I didn't write that correctly before. Uh, okay, but we'll get we'll get also to the meaning of these terms in a second. Okay, so the first term is the so-called uh, Sachs uh, Wolf term. And this is a combination of intrinsic uh, fluctuations, right, in the, in the radiation density and the potential. The second term is, um, is the Doppler term. Um, now, and the, 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 because this is a velocity and these are kind of density fluctuations, these are typically out of phase, these two terms, which means that if we, if we eventually look at correlation functions, for example, the power spectrum, which has all these peaks and troughs due to the uh, radiation pressure and, and the gravitational collapse, what, whenever, there's a, whenever there's a trough coming from this fluctuation, uh, this one will be out of phase and filling filling up the, the troughs in the spectrum. And that's also true vice versa. So whenever there's a trough here, there will be a peak here. And the last term is the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. And this term uh, effectively uh, is irrelevant for most of the history of the universe, except for early on. Uh, but during radiation domination, uh, the potentials, this term vanishes. And only recently, when dark energy becomes important, these terms uh, have started to change again. And now we're seeing uh, effects on very large scales in, in the CMB power spectrum. Yeah, so this is mostly uh, relevant now. So very early on, important very early. And very recently. Um, due to dark energy. 
Any questions about this? Okay, let's move on. So now we can use this expression. Oh, by the way, so what I think one of the plans for Thursday is that you'll work with camp and then you can play around and, and separately see the effects, these three effects, and show, okay, if I turn this off and turn this on, how does the spectrum change, right? So you see the different effects coming in. Is that correct, Will? Yeah, very good. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so now can we massage this equation and get to these transfer functions that we, that we need? Um, and it turns out we can. <coughs> so for that, we actually gonna work in Fourier space. So let us write uh, the following. theta in direction n is given by the integral d3k over 2 pi cubed e to the i k vector dot xi star n hat. And then we have two functions, a tau star k plus, or sorry, minus i k dot n, that should be hat n, b tau star k. And here we have defined two new functions, these a, t a and b. Um, so a tau star k is given by one fourth, one fourth delta y delta gamma uh, plus psi uh, plus this integral d tau psi psi dot. And then B tau star K equals VB, where we have used that under Fourier transformation, VB vector equals I K hat VB. Okay. Then, um, Then the next critical step is that we want to relate this to the initial perturbations, um, which I said we'll use these curvature perturbations R. So we define Ri uh, is um, effectively Rk is defined as R at time zero. Yeah, now of course this is not quite true, but when we work in inflation, we have a slightly different coordinate uh, system, and therefore it's not zero, but more like the end of inflation. But uh, in this gauge, uh, that's what we use. So this is how we can relate these initial conditions. And then we factor these out. So we divide everything by these initial perturbations. Um, and so when we do that, uh, we define two new, new quantities, a twiddle, k is a tau star k vector divided by these ri k vector and b twiddle k equals b tau star k vector over ri k. So the nice thing is that all the um, directional dependence is coming from the initial conditions, right? So that means that these functions only depend on the modulus of k. So you cannot introduce 
additional directional dependence at linear order um, when we have an isotropic and homogeneous universe. So then all the directional dependence is coming from these initial conditions, which really ni uh, nicely factors out. And that's something that we'll use later on to compute the correlation functions. So with this, Um, and using the following, so we can use the following, use the following correlation. So we use e to the i k vector dot chi star eta, sorry, n hat. Uh, equals the sum, so we write it in multiples i 2l plus 1, jl, so jl is a spherical Bessel function, k psi star multiplied by polynomial k hat dot n hat, okay? So we use this. And this allows us to write our fluctuations in the temperature in the following way. So we can rewrite this as the sum over L to L plus 1 times I to the power L d3k over 2 pi cubed theta L um, ri k vector p l k hat dot n hat. And here we have defined for the first time our transfer function, the function of k. So theta l here of k is defined as um, a twiddle k times j l k psi star minus b twiddle k times j l dot, yeah, that's a little annoying, yeah, dot, dot, <laughs> um, k psi star. Okay, so this is our transfer function that we've derived in terms of these functions a twiddle and b twiddle. And the next thing to get the correlation functions, right, we have to define the correlation functions of these initial conditions R. We used what we, we got yesterday, assuming an isotropic and homogeneous universe, where we're able to write that these correlation functions R of K, R of K, so now we don't start, so that changes a little bit. Uh, prime, that's just um, 2 pi squared over K cubed. Um, Yes, k cubed delta squared r, k uh, delta k vector minus or plus k vector prime. Okay, so instead of having a minus sign, you now have a plus sign. So this is our power spectrum. That's what we de define as our initial conditions. And we also use the following that um, p minus k dot n equals minus um, 1 to the power L, minus I to the power L, P K hat dot N hat. Um, and we also use the orthonormality of these polynomials. Uh, this should be L. Um, yeah, plus orthonormality. normal, or at least if you write down the product of these two. Um, we're almost there, we're almost there. Okay. So we have that 
D K um, hat P L K hat dot N hat and P L prime K hat dot N hat prime equals four pi over two uh, L plus one times P L N hat dot N hat prime delta L L prime. So we use that and then we find that the correlation function theta N theta N hat prime is given by the sum over L 2L plus 1 over 4 pi 4 pi D log K theta L squared K so these are our transfer functions multiplied by our primordial power spectrum of K um, P L N N hat prime. Yes? And then we can use the fact, yes, I'm almost done. Then we remember uh, the relation that we derived very early on in the previous lecture. So recall that we defined theta N hat, theta N hat as 1 over 4 pi sum over L 2L plus 1 CL PL N sorry PL cosine phi 1 2 where if I take 1 and 2 I could take like uh, N N prime and then I just call this N N prime okay so this is the definition that we derived yesterday by using the definition of the CLs in an isotropic universe and uh, and that allows us to relate CL equals 4 pi integral D log K theta L K squared delta R squared K Okay, so this is our main result here of today. So it tells us that indeed, whatever we observe today in our fluctuations is related to statistical properties, in this case, the power spectrum of the early universe. And, there, and in order to do that, I have to convolve my initial with these transfer functions theta L. Yeah, and there's no additional perturbations that uh, change these things. It's uh, this function you can compute, and that's what CAMP does, or class, and uh, and then you have your model from a, any model that you can, can come up with from the early universe, and that gives us the observed power spectrum in the CMB. Right. So this is very powerful. It also shows you that these things completely decouple. Right. So that there is like this 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 object could be a function of uh, like primordial parameters yeah well this object is completely determined by um, late like by evolution right uh, so for example it will depend on your densities right it will depend on uh, uh, this optical depth tau twiddle it will depend on uh, the, the growth rate of structure, right, or the, the expansion rate. Yeah, so we've, we've shown that these completely decouple these, these two contributions, uh, which is a very nice feature. And in principle, well, the nice thing now, we'll do that in lecture five, I think, on Friday is that you could write down something similar for higher order correlation functions and all that appears are some initial conditions 
involved with these with these transfer functions. Right? So any correlation function that you write down of the observed temperature field will be some integral, some sometimes more complicated than this, where I have a bunch of transfer functions, a bunch of copies of transfer functions, and that is convolved against the correlation function of the initial conditions. So that's a very nice feature, right? That uh, this works uh, in this way. And now the, the final, well, the next question, of course, is now that we have derived these transfer functions and, and in, in fact shown that there's some linear propagation of these initial statistical fluctuations, is what are these initial conditions, right? What, what, are, what, what, what are the power spectra to expect here? And are there any higher cor order correlation functions? And so tomorrow we we'll talk about how to derive this, right, from inflation. Okay, that uh, was the end of this lecture. Yes. No, so, so the transfer does not depend on, on uh, well, no, I mean, that's the nice thing. So whatever you change here does not affect, affect what changes here. Yeah. Right, but I think the main point is that, um, in terms of how you get to the CLs, that part of the equation is completely decouples from these initial conditions. So they, that's, the, that's, that's the nice feature here, that this transfer, fu this transfer function, even though you could, you could say, okay, eventually, of course, the final power spectrum will be some combination of all these parameters. But that's, of course, what this does still say, right? This thing is still a function of all these parameters. It's just that the way you compute it in that sense, it completely decouples. So you can compute these separately from this. And then still get the final result correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but I think that that's also the point, right? So if we, I mean, you could, so that's why people say, hey, can you fix the Hubble tension with either something here or something here? Yeah, most efforts focus on this, for example, right? Whether there's something in here in, in the physics that like all the, the evolution equation of, of your fluctuations, whether I'm missing a term. For, for example, with this exotic dark energy model, right? You change the evolution of dark energy and that will change the background equations in such a way that these things will, will change and therefore the inferred value of H naught will differ, right? Because my fit, if I fit, so the point of course is that you fit this against data and that will give you, give you best fit parameters of both this function and this function. And so if I change this, I might get different values for H, H naught. And there's another, I mean, people have also looked into this, right? They, they, you, you can, in principle, also change the initial conditions, but to, to make this work, it's a lot more, I would say it's a lot more contrived to do that. Um, but yeah, that's my, first. yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. So I, th I think the main point is that I totally agree, which is that, but the computational part completely decouples. Yeah. 
Well, no, no. So okay. So wait, wait a second. In this transfer function, in this transfer function, there's no more fluctuations. The fluctuations are all in here. They're all in here. The only thing this transfer function is saying is that how are these flank fluctuations transferred based on the cosmology that I assume? Yeah, but transfer function in in the end. Um, uh, Right, this psi is true, that is true, but these are just evolution equations at fixed values, and in the end, you right, remember that you, you divide out this initial density fluctuation, this initial fluctuation, and that takes care of this entire, whatever directional dependence you had in these psi is, is removed by dividing by this r, and that means also the, the fluctuations are removed in that. So all that is left is truly only a function that depends on the modulus of k, and it's only transferring fluctuations. It's only telling how the fluctuations in the initial field are transferred to the fluctuations in the temperature field. There's no more fluctuations inside this R, because we have divided those out by dividing by R. Yeah. Yes. Any more questions? All right.